National Evolutionary Synthesis Center and Understanding Evolution, this is the Evolution in the News story for May 2008. I'm Kristen Jenkins. Octopuses have been studied in the lab for a number of reasons. Because of their well-developed nervous system and brain, Octopuses are good study subjects for learning experiments. Their excellent eyesight has also been used as a model system for understanding vision. However, less is known about octopus life in their natural habitats. Dr. Roy Caldwell, professor of integrated biology at the University of California, Berkeley, is going to talk about a recent study on the octopus Adopus aculeatus, Christine Hufford did this research as a graduate student in Dr. Caldwell's lab. She is now a postdoctoral fellow at the Monterey Bay Aquarium Research Institute. They were studying Adopus aculeatus in its native environment and made some interesting discoveries about unexpected complex mating behaviors. Here, Dr. Caldwell describes the field research that he and Dr. Hufford did. Basically, what's involved in studying octopuses is a lot of patience and being in the right place at the right time. Um, up until these present studies which were done in the field, most studies on octopus have been done um, in the laboratory uh, in artificial situations and they've been done on only a very few species. To do a field study requires a very special kind of octopus. You have to have one that uh, is abundant enough to be able to find, has to occur in habitats where you actually can spend some time and observe the animals. Um, it helps if the animal is day active, uh, otherwise you're out there in the middle of the night and you use lights to try to look at it, um, the animal will probably respond to the lights, not do anything that you want it to. Adopus aculeatus occurs throughout Indonesia and northern Australia. Uh, most of the studies were done on Vinakan Island, uh, in northern Sulawesi, um, but some of the work was also done on Lizard Island in North Queensland, Australia. Octopus anatomy is a little strange to most of us. It's not obvious how octopuses actually have sex. Dr. Caldwell explains the basics of octopus sex for us. Basically, octopus uh, transfer a spermatophore or a package of sperm. The male transfers it to the female. Uh, inserts it into her mantle cavity and then into her genital opening. And the way he does this is by producing this spermatophore inside of his own mantle cavity and then transfers it to a groove in his third right arm, which is called the hectocotylus. He then inserts his hectocotylus, or his third right arm, into the female's uh, mantle cavity and a peristaltic wave or muscular contraction passes the spermatophore down the length of his arm into her mantle cavity and ultimately into her genital opening. The discoveries that Dr. Caldwell and Dr. Hufford made are documented in a collection of images. Next, Dr. Caldwell takes us through several of these images and a video from the study describing the behavior seen in each one. Yeah, we're still looking at image number one, uh, which shows a female on the left and a male on the right uh, the male's third right arm, his hectocotylus, is uh, stretching out towards the female and is actually inserted uh, into her mantle cavity. So right about now there should be a spermatophore being uh, transported from him to her. Uh, the second image is a close-up of insertion. Uh, what you're seeing is a female and if you look at about, oh, five o'clock there is one arm that comes into the picture and it has a red or reddish groove. That's actually the groove in the male's mating arm and he's fully inserted into her mantle cavity and the red streak uh, actually uh, shows us where the spermatophore is being moved and it's just about ready to uh, move into her. The third uh, image shows a male with the typical brown stripe display which indicates his maleness or the fact that he's a dominant male. Okay, what you're seeing is a female who starts to move away and the 
white arm coming in from 9 o'clock is actually the hectocotylus or mating arm of the male which is inserted. You can see as she moves forward the male is being drug along by his mating arm. You can also see in this video the presence of the brown stripes that signal that he is a male um, as opposed to the queen or the solid color of the female. Here Dr. Caldwell describes the mate guarding and sneaking behaviors in more detail. Mate guarding. Uh, a female settles in, in a burrow which is down in the, in the bench of the reef. Um, and a male will come and if he's going to associate with her usually uh, dig a burrow well, maybe two feet away a maximum one to two feet. That's within one arm's reach of the female and he'll copulate with her several times and maintain that association um, often sitting tall advertising the fact that he's a male he does that by putting a couple of uh, brown stripes down the front and it basically says to any other octopus I'm a male and I'm here and I'm ready to fight and defend this female um, that guarding activity can last for just a day or two or as much as uh, 10 days uh, and during that time, any other male which approaches, um, the male aggressively attacks and tries to chase off. Um, and if the female needs to go foraging, uh, the guarding male will accompany her, um, actually often with the hectocotylus arm inserted into her mantle cavity while they're, they're foraging. Um, in terms of sneaking behavior, Usually it occurs when there is uh, a large female being guarded by a, a large male. Uh, a small male has no chance of aggressively uh, evicting the big male and get, gaining access to the female. So the alternative is to assume the guise of a female in both color and texture. This is kind of a tan color, oftentimes uh, this little papilla on the skin, um, and move as closely as possible to the female um, to attempt to copulate with her. If the male were to see this sneaking male, he looks like another female and probably would not be terribly interested. Um, this was successful on several occasions. In one case, the sneaking male did appear as a uh, female to the guarding male and he attempted to copulate with her, him, yet. Finally, Dr. Caldwell explains his interest in this kind of research. One of the one of the questions that I'm often asked is, you know, why study octopus sex? And you know, it's fun, it's interesting, but it's kind of a strange way to make a living. And what really is important about this study is because it's a comparative study and we can look from animal group to animal group and we see the same behaviors evolving. We can start to look at what's common in the environment and in the, the behavior that has shaped, and evolution has shaped this in a particular way. So we know for example that mate guarding is occurring in some species and not in others and often that has to do with sperm precedence and protecting one's paternity. The other reason that one wants to study uh, these kinds of systems is because they are interesting and I'm all for people satisfying their curiosity about the complexity of nature because if you're interested in an octopus mating or a stomatopod striking or whatever the things I do then you're probably interested in keeping those animals around and learning more about them and the best way to do that is to maintain their habitat and make sure that they're here for the next decade and the next century. And anything that we can do to increase public awareness of the need to preserve habitat and preserve these animals, uh, I'm all for. For more information about this story, including links to primary and popular literature and classroom resources, visit the National Evolutionary Synthesis Center website or the Understanding Evolution website. More stories are available in the Evolution and the News archives on either site. The National Evolutionary Synthesis Center is funded by the National Science Foundation.
to promote research in biological evolution.